Can you explain to me what agricultural modelling is? What does it do? Well, modelling is like a, it's building from a concept and trying to replicate reality into places where it doesn't exist or if we want to change management that we actually don't do at the moment. When you set a bunch of rules and if you combine these rules in terms of management, it's much easier to have a model to play with in a computer than to set all of these combinations in experimental plots. So in terms of uh, expenditure of a, a setting, an experiment, at least we should have a look at models to uh, have an idea of uh, what would be the result of an experimental setup without spending the money. <laughs> so in a, in a way models help you to give you information on how the system could be by changing some management practices or not. It's particularly important uh, in, when you speak about trees because trees take a long time to grow and there is currently and it's very difficult to get a, a budget or a project or finance for having a combination of different forest uh, densities with different forest soils with different forest textures uh, soil textures with different uh, pruning regimes with different thinning regimes imagine all of these combinations of different management alternatives in an experimental plot then you need to wait 30 to 40 years models also help uh, to try to project these conditions into the future which you cannot do experimentally in a large scale. You can do very controlled uh, conditions which sometimes are too much control and they're not representing uh, uh, the real uh, situation and then models also help you to okay provide you the trends what would be it would be a, a decrease or an increase uh, of yield or uh, the water regime, what would be the water yield, the water percolation to the soil, whatever the model can, comes, comes or brings information to, to you, you can play around with all these kind of scenarios and which is kind of a, a preliminary or a complementary tool to bring you information to solve a particular problem or to prepare to a particular problem, to adapt to a problem in the future. And um, I think it's the main, the main, uh, the core uh, reason for models to, to, to exist. How do you go about the process of building the model? When you're creating a model, you create from a concept, ideas, and you build a draw in your head or in a piece of paper in a cafe, which is the case of Yieldsafe. So Yieldsafe was born in a cafe, in a, drinking a beer, in, the, in a drawing in a napkin, where you just build a transform the knowledge you have or the relationships you know more or less which are happening into a mathematical um, concept or equation that could represent the growth of something. And of course there's different um, processes involved. You have light, rain, uh, uh, radiation which is the main uh, source of energy for building f for, for photosynthesis to build, to build up energy which is then transferred into other uh, livestock or whatever. Everything is energy. So everything comes, originally comes from the sun. So there's a way to transform this energy into um, biomass. And, but it only, it's only possible if you have other conditions like water in the soil. So a plant can have lots of radiation, but it doesn't have water in the soil. Uh, you can't produce anything because you need water. So merging all these already two equations to availability of resources, which is radiation and, 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 and water, um, it's already uh, uh, two equations, let's call it, mixed up. And then you, of course you have temperature. If it's cold, if you have lots of radiation, lots of water, but it's cold, you don't grow as well, <laughs> you freeze. So it's like a, a threshold, um, play around be between uh, parameters, it's called parameters, uh, that you play around with these equations, uh, then it's, you simulate the grow growth conditions for plants to grow. Um, and so you, you, you start from a conceptual phase, you bring that concept to equations, and then you, these equations have parameters. And 
you, ha you need to have add meaning to parameters. Usually comes from people that study photosynthesis. How much grams per megajoule of radiation does this tree uh, is able to produce, for example? Uh, or the grass. It's the same. It's the same parameter, but maybe the tree is much more efficient than this grass, or vice versa. It's called a parameterization. And then, if you have observed data, some people go to the field, collect data, measure trees, and measure biomass, measure leaf area, measure whatever, and then we try to make the equations, predictions, matching the points, which is called calibration calibrating the parameters to these points, the lines, fitting the lines to the points of observed data, which is our framing our mathematical concept into the real world. So to the real world where we match the equations into the real data, it's called calibration. And after you calibrate this tree, for example, this tree growing, uh, we just go to another climate and try to see what the model would say which is like a simulation. So you have the concept, parameterization, calibration, and then simulation in another place. That's basically how models work, uh, and it's fun. <laughs> Where does the information usually come from that you require for the model? Because it seems to me if you get poor quality information, you're going to end up with a poor quality model. Mm -hmm. So there must be challenges there to get the right kind of information of the right kind of quality. So, so how do you go about doing that? Well, that's if you calibrate the model for rub with rubbish data, if you project, you will project rubbish uh, pro project uh, simul projectors projections. That's 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 pretty clear. If you calibrate this with the wrong data or uh, or data which is not um, good. Uh, it's a wrong calibration, so model will predict wrong uh, predictions. In the 90s there was a trend to, to build very complicated models, very precise, very highly parameterized to describe as much as we can. And, um, but then in the end, after 10 years of research on worldwide with this trend, they realized that it's very hard to use these models because you don't have exactly the quality data in the terms of parameters to use the models. So all of the models were very good in terms of mathematical implementation or implement conceptual. They were very hard to use. So the next decade we tried to change this concept and okay, let's build simple models that try to capture as much as, much as we can in terms of processes. And um, Yosef is one of these models. And we, what we try to do is, okay, if, if the data is not good, um, or at least we can have general data which could represent what would be the biomass of these trees. It doesn't need to be precise or very precise. It just gives you an, an idea. And, um, and this yield safe model, for example, it's very interesting because you can use, for example, yield tables, which is something which was published in the 70s worldwide, in the 60s and 70s, which is like a measurements of trees and builds a different kind of class, yield classes, different sizes of trees. And we set the model to, okay, this is the potential yield, this is the lowest yield, and the model will try to capture in between, which is the different management alternatives, civic cultural practices. And uh, that's for forestry, for example, to simplify it. Um, and these yield tables are very stable, they're very strong, largely measured, uh, and usually you can get this type of data. And if, we, if the data we, we use is from strong uh, data, and then we have a calibrate a new model calibrated with strong data from the past. We can work for the future with good quality data. The yield safe is called it's, it's sparse parameter. So it's, we have very about five, six, seven parameters to describe the growth of a tree, and of course you will have error. But the thing is, if you have peaks up and down, the error will be uh, plus or minus, plus or minus, and the trend will be the what you actually want, which is that the, the information you want from the model is to what, what will be the growth, more or less, from this tree, from this grass, from this whatever. So you usually don't, you don't look at the absolute values, you look at the relative values, which is more important, and then people look at the data and trans, transfer that to the, their own knowledge, which is the 
the key thing to, when looking at models is don't look at the absolute values, look at relative values, look at trends, not the absolute values. I'm not, if I project a, a tree growth for the next 50 years and the model gives, is giving you like 1.5 cubic meters of in a tree, uh, maybe it's 1.1 or 1.6 or 1.4, but gives you a, an idea of what would be the yield with or without climate change. But the difference, it's the key thing. It gives you more 20%. I would trust more at the 20% rather than 1.5, 1.5 relative to 1.2 or something like that. Um, but the error is always present in any kind of model, either empirical, process-based, even us being humans, error is there. <laughs> we have to live with it. <laughs> so how do you know when the model is complete and that you can leave one model and then move on to another model? Are you always constantly tinkering to improve it, to improve it, to improve it? <laughs> yeah, that's a very, that's the very easy uh, answer. A model is never, it's never, it's never ended. Uh, naturally, well, naturally, people, well, if you are finishing when one thing, well, when you are doing research, when you finish a particular part of thing in research, there's another ten questions after your result. So it's part of a scientific concept, uh, and also when you when you are modeling, there's another. T after you do the things you were originally proposed to do uh, two or three years ago, at the end, okay, let's do this and do that and do that. And people start using the model, and uh, this could be that, could be that, could be done, could be done, and you start to evolve the model. So it's an ever-ending story. You can always integrate stuff. And the key here is okay. Should we start a new model? Or, uh, or keep feeding the monster to become a bigger monster. So that's the, the key thing. Usually the, we keep feeding the monster because it's easy, because we are used to it. But then there's a threshold of people trying to work with this monster and they don't feel attracted anymore. So integrating more stuff, it's part of the model, modeling. So it's a never ending story, I think. It's, uh, it's good, but it's... Uh, we need, we need to be careful to feed the monster because <laughs> it's bigger than us and it just lose control. Uh, and it just need to bring results and bring... Uh, it's the most important thing. Don't lose the focus. Keep your ideas uh, and objectives focused and try to make the model to work for you and not you working for the model. <laughs> so, it's a challenge. But... Is there anything particularly interesting or, or challenging in trying to develop models for agroforestry processes? Oh, certainly is. Uh, it's, uh, it's on the mix, which is the challenge. Uh, we have very good models in agriculture, we have very good models in, agri in, in forestry, uh, but mixing uh, agriculture and forestry in the same, to compete by the same resource, it's something which is not well understood, it's far from being well understood. It's, we are on the way on our path to understand how the interactions between trees and crops or pasture um, works. But it's a very complex. So you have radiation competition, you have water competition, you have lots of biological activity, different biological activity, and you have lots of different water relationships. You have nutrient relationships, trees recovering uh, nitrogen from below root zones of the crops. All of this needs to be quantified and you don't see uh, results, many results or substantial results that can support that this is happening, that's how it happens and this is the way to do it uh, um, to give you a specific farmer that wants to implement agroforestry for example. Uh, the agroforestry should, should be as something that can work on your farm. You need to think on how you should implement. Uh, it's not something to copy. Uh, that's the easy. Yeah, Agroforest is not an easy landscape. It's part already from, needs to come from you somehow in a, in a, in a need to change to implement agroforestry. It's a much more challenging. It's much more fun in terms of dealing with all this diversity of problems that arise from agroforestry but it's um, it's more fun it's more uh, it's not so every, every day the same thing uh, it's not for everybody agroforestry 
uh, because it's uh, if you if you want to simplify your your life, it's agroforest is not your way. <laughs> but it's uh, it's like life. I mean, if you want to simplify your life, you can simplify your life. But you'll find after a few years that life, simple life, it's not the thing you want. It's something that you need something more than a simple life. You need some color. You need some complexity. You need some interactions. You need some stuff it's like agroforestry it's, it's like agriculture you have a, a field with wheat boring <laughs> some people like it <laughs> but uh, i like more heterogeneous landscapes and heterogeneous management and different management and different prunings different uh, interactions going on different birds different if you look at one field of monoculture agriculture you don't think too much about what's going on and what's our relationships going on there it's like a desert. Uh, people think as deserts uh, as the Sahara Desert, but the desert by definition could be in Greenland, for example. It's just a ice with almost nothing there. It's like the same as an, a, 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 an arable field. We have one species, probably won't have anything more because everything is so sprayed, so well cleaned. So you have only one species and the soil underneath which is the same as the desert. Maybe the, the, the Sahara Desert has more biodiversity than a, uh, an intensive uh, um, field of wheat. And people don't realize that. They don't think it's a desert. It's a very nice landscape of food, <laughs> basically. Modeling is clearly complex, uh, complicated, and a specialist area of work. So it seems to me that's likely to make it challenging to communicate what you do but also the products that you produce for them to be used by other people. How do you avoid that, that challenge of making something so esoteric, so complicated, you lose sight of the purpose, which is, I assume, to benefit farmers in the long run? Well, the key thing to, to don't lose focus is to keep, answering this, keep questioning the main purpose of, of your work. Farmers are used to... Uh, a nearly uh, balance so they, they spend money they earn money and the balance is something you know with the, when we introduce agroforestry uh, to show if it's profitable or not you need to extend these years to the from the start of the tree until the end uh, uh, when you cut the tree so this is already a, something different than the farmer is not used to look at so because you need to do 10, 15, 20 years uh, balance and then it somehow either you see the only the figure at the end if the system itself it's uh, more profitable or not and you can see maybe the, 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 the standing value of your system which is increasing so I get more value the agroforestry than the arable but in the end of the day, in the end of the year they actually need cash and this cash is not available but it's standing cash that will recover in the end so it's already different concept of making farmer figures and uh, you need to train people to think differently because agroforestry is not the same as an arable system because you have an yearly income and in agroforestry you have, might have a, 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 an early uh, yearly in income but you also have a, an income in the end which is not accounting for the for for every year but it's you get the money a bit further uh, uh, later um, and this message sometimes it's difficult to tell people because people are used to their box, their comfort zone. It's normal, it's human. People are comfortable with their own uh, ongoing business. So it's part of the challenge to bring the message, uh, keep it simple. Because if you just try to talk about molding, people won't listen to you. 